class on cash root. Thank you for the recording. Uh, welcome to the class on cash root on um, February the 4th, uh, 2024. Um, so I just want to start with a quick exercise. And I'd like people to just talk about what the term cash air, uh, otherwise pronounced kosher, means. So please uh, just sort of unmute yourself and uh, fire some ideas about what you think the term cash air, kosher means. I think to the Orthodox people, it would mean a set of rules by which food can and can't be eaten. What kind of food and also how it's prepared. Okay. Um, I, was, I was taught technically it means clean. Um, but, you know, I don't know. <laughs> to me, it just means, oh. you know, observant. Obse oh. Observant? Yeah. Ob okay. Um, yeah, just go ahead, yeah. I, I was, uh, it's not, to me, it's not only about food, because they're objects, but also appropriate. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you can have, a, a, let's say, a candle that is kosher for Havdalah. Uh -huh. and it, that means it has been, it was, has been made according to the rules. So that that's what my understanding that expanded my understanding of what um, because it's it goes uh, it follows certain rules. That's yeah. I seem to recall it meaning literally separation, like not only right. from the separation of like meat and milk, etc., but what's clean and unclean, what's Jewish and what's not. Okay, Jewish and not Jewish. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Well, yeah. um, in uh -huh. high school, I knew a girl who I don't think was Jewish, but um, she would use the word kosher to mean like cool or acceptable, um, huh. like. Uh, if her hair would curl, she would say the curls are not kosher. Right, yes. <laughs> yeah. There was somebody else. Um, yeah, I was going to say it's like proper, um, proper yeah. fit, fit for use, I think is what the phrase I saw was. Fit for use, yeah. Okay, great. So, there's a, so we've got food. Can and cannot be eaten. What can and cannot be eaten? Clean, uh, observant, not just food. Appropriate, according to the rules, following certain rules. Separation, unclean, uh, unclean versus clean. Jewish and not Jewish. Acceptable, cool, proper, fit for a, fit for use. And and I would say that most of those are correct interpretations of the term kasher. <clears throat> so uh, has anybody heard of Del Boy? from like Rodney Trotter and Del Boy. It was a famous British sitcom. Uh, uh, they were Cockneys from the 1990s and early 1990s. And they would always say, oh, that's proper kosher, that. You know, talking about, uh, they, were, they were kind of hustlers. You know, they would get things off the street and sell them and things like that. And if they would find something that was really good for uh, for selling, they would say, oh, it's proper kosher, that. So, I mean, they're fit for use, basically. Yeah. So, uh, well done, everyone. Uh, that was a good exercise. So, which food, it should say food, which food sources are not deemed kosher according to the Torah? Uh, do we know? Do you want to uh, shout out some ideas? Pigs. Pigs. Yeah. Shellfish. Oh. Shellfish. Birds of prey. Not that you particularly want to eat them anyway. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I would expand that to mean generally predators are not generally kosher. Predators, yeah. Um, isn't it um, not kosher to to mix the meat of our, of an animal with like the food of its young, like milk and meat? 
Anything I else? think the Karaites took that to mean you can't cook uh, meat with dairy, whereas the rabbis meant that you, you can't have eat milk or dairy products with meat at all, and you have to separate the 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 cooking vessels and the whole bit. Mm-hmm. Which is, it's kind of weird because chickens don't have milk, but yet I'm not <laughs> sure. Is chicken considered to be not able to be eaten with milk in kashrut you're right we'll talk yeah. about we'll talk about milk and meat in a in a bit um uh, but other yeah. a, any parts of an animal body that cannot be fully uh exsanguinated that they can take the blood completely out of it it has to be i mean you can have a sirloin of a of a ritually slaughtered cow is still not fit to eat not fit to eat because it can't right. be the blood can't be drained when it's slaughtered so it's right. also yeah. has to do with how you slaughter oh. yeah so so food that is slaughtered correctly yeah any uh, animal that doesn't chew its cud and have a split hoof right yeah most insects and rodents insects and rodents insects swarm. Yeah. <clears throat> any animal or any fish that doesn't have fins and scales. Yeah. I've heard that rabbits aren't kosher either. Right? <clears throat> They're not. Yeah. You Can couldn't we have a look eat, at the list. You couldn't well, I used to be I used to keep kosher. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um there are a lot of rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you couldn't eat Okay, let me see if I can get them all. Loin, sirloin, um, rump roast. I can't remember all of them, but I yeah. know you can eat rump roast, sirloin. Yeah. Oh, um, does somebody does somebody want to read? Does somebody want to read uh, from the screen? Or taking turns to read between you? Speak to the children of Israel. Leviticus 11, 1 through 8. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The rock hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, their carcasses you shall not touch, they are unclean to you. Thank you. And does somebody want to say, what what do you notice about why you're not allowed to eat them? It's because they either don't chew cud or they don't have Mm. cloven hooves. But what is it that they are classified as if you can't eat them? Oh, unclean. Unclean, <laughs> Un- unclean yeah, unclean. So that in the Hebrew is tamay, which can also mean irregular. So just bear that in mind. It can be impure, irregular, or unclean. So there's one category there of animals that are unclean or tamay. Okay. So the next, so the next category uh, list, let's have a look at that. Uh, somebody else want to read this? I will. I'll go. These, oh, there's Leviticus 11, 9 to 12. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the sea or in the rivers, that you may eat. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abom- as an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. Thank you. 
and um, what what do we think abomination means? That that's a tricky word because I think in in modern in modern parlance it has a more negative word uh, uh, sense than 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 in Hebrew. Uh, I think it also was something like I mean that it shouldn't that you shouldn't have anything to do with it. That's what I understood. Mm, but may, yeah. maybe I'm I'm coming connecting it to other famous Leviticus verses that have been very much spoken about in other like, things. Like forbidden? Yeah. Forbidden? But, right, mm -hmm. so it's sheket in Hebrew. Um, it's different from tamay. It's not the same as unclean. And a, an abomination is something that is supposed to be utterly despicable. Okay. It's not not something that we do. We would not eat that. It's absolutely disgusting. So I want you to bear in mind that even though this is a very strong term, um, just bear in mind what this idea is. You know, when you see these animals, when, when you think of these animals, their flesh or eating them, if you see a people that do eat this category of animals, your reaction would be, that's disgusting. Whereas the other ones is just, they are unclean to you but there's no sort of judgment of a people that eat them in that other text. So there's two sort of types of um, non-kosher categories of animals. The one that is unclean and the one that is disgusting or, or abominable. Okay, so just keep that in mind and think about what that feeling means. I think so, abomination, if it's abominable, I think that they're not even supposed to touch them or handle them. Yeah, yeah, it says that in the text. Uh, their flesh, you shall not touch their, their car carcasses. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. But it said that about the unclean, too, that you shouldn't handle them. Yeah, you shouldn't handle them. But it says they're unclean, whereas this is abominable. I, so there's I, two, yeah. I, I guess right. that's what uh, allows uh, Orthodox people to wear furs mm -hmm. of, of animals that are, are, are not cashier to, for eating but you can still I mean I, I, I've never understood how people can wear you know a, 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 a bear furs or foxes furs and be orthodox at the same time that for me has always been mm. a mystery yeah well exactly you're not supposed to touch their flesh so yeah okay so uh, we'll just look at some of the um, categories here there are mammals without cloven hooves and rumination. That's the chewing the cud. There are birds of prey. There are fish without fins or scales, like the catfish. All invertebrates, apart from some kinds of locusts. Yay. So you should be quite happy that you can't eat any invertebrates apart from locusts. There you go. <laughs> uh, all reptiles. All amphibians never last. So that is meat from an animal animal that has uh, already died without being slaughtered properly. So, um, Gabrielle, you mentioned that before. Um, Terefa is an injured animal. That's an animal with a significant defect or injury. You would not be allowed to kill an animal that is injured in order to then partake of its flesh. Wow. Dam is a category there, which is blood, which was also mentioned before. Blood in general is uh, not kosher. Um, Helev, uh, I can't see the full. Um, I can't see the full. Can somebody read it? The, the Helev suet, it's fat from animals that can be used for temple sacrifice, like cattle, sheep, goat. Uh, the only kosher domestic livestock uh, it can only be killed for meat, but not for fat. Exactly, yeah. Uh, the sciatic nerve. You cannot eat the sciatic nerve. Uh, the limb of a living animal. Believe it or not, there are practices where people do that. 
um, untithed produce. So this is not just animals now. This is grains, right. vegetables, etc. Fruit during the first three years of the tree's life. What is anyone is anyone familiar with that one? No. Or unfamiliar? No. I didn't yeah, know that so one. The, yeah, so there's a there's a Torah law that uh, w when you plant a tree in its first three years of life, you are not allowed to partake of its fruit. One yeah. question I have on on that one is is that it's common yeah. practice for a lot of people that grow fruit trees to take off the fruit, but not not to eat it, but just to keep it for, keep the tree to keep producing green leaves rather than fruit for yeah. those first yeah. few years. Is is this Maybe a, a yeah. bit of that or, or not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is that is what they're doing there. Yeah, you, you're supposed to let the tree um, come into its own, basically. You, yeah, the fruit is supposed to go back into the earth. Um, it's supposed to contribute to the um, environment around it, etc. Um, and then the next category is new grain. So during it's, I'm sorry about the typo, people. <laughs> During the first year, uh, that's supposed to say. And then, um, okay, go back to the thing. Uh, where are we? Um, yes, and wine of libation, libation. So does anyone know what libation is? Mm -hmm. Like a pagan ritual of toasting or something that could have been used for pagan worship? Right. So also libation uh, is quite a common practice. Some people pour um, alcohol onto the grave mm -hmm. or onto the earth. Um, it, some people say to my ancestors or whatever. Um, and it also you, uh, libation was popular in, uh, in, pagan, in pagan cultures, in the Roman Empire, in the Greek Empire, etc. Um, it was, yeah, it was used to kind of offer to the, to the gods. Um, so that type of wine is not kosher. Cool. So it's quite a quite a expansive list. So then we move on to mixtures. So the following mixtures are prohibited by Torah. And can somebody read that for me? I'll do it. Kill I am crossbreeding, plowing, using different animals working together, grafting of trees, mixed seeds, wool, and linen, or shatnas. Yeah, exactly. Anything stand out there? Does the grafting of does the grafting apply to just trees, or would it apply to wine uh, grapes? I'm I'm thinking about a lot of grape uh, grapes grown for wine are done with a different rootstock than the top part because of there's some parasites that attack the roots of grapes. And I'm wondering is is that an issue, or is it just for trees that that would be an issue? So I've not heard of that practice. I've never come across that. Um, I don't know. Uh, but I know that certainly grafting trees is not is not kosher. So that means that nectarines are not kosher. Yes, there's also there's also a drink called quinotto, which comes from uh, it only grows in Tunisia and Italy, and it's the laurel tree grafted to an, a type of orange. Uh -huh. um, that's also very popular, and that that's also not allowed. So I think that you're not allowed to graft. The tree, but I think if they then start growing naturally, that they wouldn't be they would be kosher. Now, you are not allowed to to graft the tree. Now the thing is, like apples, apples are not you don't plant seeds. All apples are 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 by definition they are your grafts are grafts because uh you if you plant a seed of an apple. Uh, probably the fruits will be inedible. So I don't know if that has to do with different varieties or different uh, uh, kinds of, of, of things, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to eat apples at all. Yeah, so it's about mixing different types mm -hmm. together. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
that yeah. that might alleviate the issue with um with wine that James brought up because the root stocks are from a grape variety uh, in the North America that was resistant to the bug called phylloxera, which hit mm. all of Europe and most of North America. The only place it sort of missed was for some reason, Chile. Uh, but mm. pretty much when you, um, most all of uh, the French and European grape varieties have to be now grafted onto the North American root stock, but it's also a grape variety. Um, mm. and, but it's more, it's resistant to that pest. So that mm. if they're both grapes, then maybe that might be a, a way around it. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Phyllis, you got your hand up, but just go ahead. Um, so, okay. So I'm thinking that would mean that none of the seeds we get here in America are kosher because, um, you know, when you go to like, the garden shops to buy seeds or whatever, they're like, okay, unless they say heirloom. Yeah, they're like mixed all up with some of everything. And I'm thinking like you go to the grocery store, you buy something called, called a pluot. Mm. Uh, yeah. Is that not a kosher fruit? So you can't sow mixed seeds. So for example, some people do that where they sow seeds in vineyards especially and the fruit of that uh, vine is not kosher if there are mixed plants around it and when you have your field you have to have the varieties separate you can't plant and mix all of the different species together so a lot of a lot of these rules are about mixing things together in other words things should be in their natural uh, state what about GMO food? That would be non-kosher then? What's GMO food? Um, genetically modified. Genetically modified food. Um, that's would would that why would that be? Not because they they introduce they 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 introduce let's say a uh, a uh, uh, a gene from a different fruit to other two. In order to make them more resistant, or do, in order to make them, uh, I mean, there are many reasons to, uh, or, mm. or to make make them uh, more productive. And there's a right. whole thing. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a mark, a, a thing, a stamp of non-genetically modified, right? Uh, yes. Uh, non gmo yeah. yeah. So I've not heard that genetically modified food is not kosher, but um, remember that at the moment we're looking at the Torah. Yeah. So when I think when the ancient Israelites wrote these words, um, they weren't thinking about genetically modified food. <laughs> so uh, probably that's the easy answer. And then the next one is, uh, yeah, kilei hakayim, other plants grown in vineyards. So kilei hakayim is its own category of mixed food of mixed species. So mixing in general is not allowed, but kilei hakayim is specific, is specifically set aside as another category that is not kosher. Um, and this reminds me, at Limud this year, Limud festival, on uh, they gave out, it was environmentally, environmentally friendly uh, Limud, they gave out packets of seeds, and the person I was sat next to said, we can't take these because they're mixed. So apparently some people do think about that. Exactly. That is my point. I'm holding up two packages of seeds right now. These seeds say mixed carrots and carnival blend sweet peppers. Now, th these were the seeds that I was going to plant in my garden this year. They're already mixed in the package. Uh-huh. You can't. If you are adhering to the laws of Torah, you wouldn't be able to sew them together. Okay, but whether that means that the packets render the seeds not kosher is another story. Oy vey. <laughs> <Is that me? laughs> yeah, okay. non GMO on the back, but I mean they're already GMO'd inside the package. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so so to say it in, in Ladino, wo por mi por los moros. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> exactly. 
Okay, so are these Kashrut laws applied universally? Do all traditional Jewish groups apply these laws in the same way? Somebody before mentioned Karaites, so let's take a look at the Karaite perspective. What do we see on the left? Those that have watched one of the videos uh, will be aware of this. What is this on the left? Me? Oh, on the left, cheeseburger. Cheeseburger. And what's it's on the right? Bullshit. Oh, that's gyro meat or something. Bob? Shwarma. 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 It's shwarma, yeah. So which one of these, for those that haven't seen the video, so if you've seen it, don't cheat. <laughs> What? Uh, why? Why are these? Uh, why are these pictures up here? What? What would be significant about the picture on the left? Well, the cheeseburger is not the... kosher. <laughs> yeah, definitely not kosher. Why? Hey, you, you're mixing dairy with meat. Oh, that's rabbinical. Right. And what about the one on the right? Isn't it the grade of the meat or something? Of the meat. Let's let's assume um, that this is in a Jewish restaurant. So it's from a kosher animal. It would have been slaughtered correctly. What's okay. on the top? Those that haven't seen the video can answer this. What's on the top of it? That. Mm. Fat. It's fat. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. From an animal that it from the same animal that was killed. So, why is that significant? There is a prohibition of milk and meat that is not found in Torah, but is yes. prohibited by rabbinites and permitted by Karaites. So, that for rabbinites, which most of us come from rabbinic. Rabbinite means rabbinic Judaism. Most of us are coming from this background or we are adopting a form of rabbinic Judaism even humanistic Judaism is a form of rabbinic Judaism um, so for us generally that's prohibited but it's not prohibited in the Torah so what does the Torah actually say does anybody yes. know do you want to somebody that maybe is not so familiar with with this does anybody want to give a guess, or maybe you know? Something to the effect that they should not see the kid in its mother's milk. Mm -hmm. Right. It I'm... sounds like you knew that, Phyllis. <laughs> 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 so, see the... so, let's not cheat, Phyllis. <laughs> so, no, exactly. Do not... So, what it says is... Uh, I've... My screen... Do not boil. Reason. Yeah, do not see it is correct, yeah. Uh don't know why, but my my screen froze. Um there we go. That's what it says. Lots of us shall get the chalev imar. Do not see, which also means boil, a kid in his mother's milk. So just to be clear, we're talking about kid goat, right? Yeah. yeah. So specifically the Torah says do not see the Baby goat in his in its mother's milk. So why then is the one on the top right, the shawarma, not kosher according to that? Is it or is it not? Like what's the relevance? Sorry, the top left, not the top right. Why would that be not kosher then? What, According it, to the it, quote, you mean? Yeah, it's the cheeseburger. Um, are cheeseburgers always made from kids? No, cheeseburgers are usually made from cattle. Right. And the cheese, does that come from the cattle's mother? No. Uh, no. No. It's not from, usually. Probably it's not. It's from cheese not food, far, it's not even milk. <laughs> yeah, not as far as I know anyway. <laughs> um, so, lamb and uh, sheep fat prohib prohibition is is found in Torah, but rabbinic Jews permit it. 
and Karaya prohibit it. So the shwarma at the top um, is made from an animal that could be slaughtered for temple sacrifice. Remember? There's mm -hmm. three types of animals that you can slaughter for temple sacrifice, and you are not allowed to use the fat of that animal. So shawarma has fat on top, which gives it like a lot of flavor. The, the fat, as it spins, the fat uh, drips down over the meat, giving it like a unique taste. That's not kosher, according to the Torah. Yet, for rabbinic Jews, this prohibition of milk and meat is extended far beyond what the Torah says, and the prohibition of fat is not extended. So immediately we can see there that some of the rules that we associate with mainstream Judaism are not exactly as they are in the Torah, meaning there was a system of interpretation that developed over the centuries, which brought us to this time where we have certain um, rules around what food we can eat and what we can't. Is that clear? Yeah. Yep. Great. So do any of the above categories that we just, uh, the aforementioned categories, strike you as having any ethical significance and why? So at this point, I'm going to ask us to be put into um, rooms. What's it called? Rooms, right? Breakout. Yeah. Um, breakout rooms, yeah, so that we can discuss this. And I'd like you to choose one of the categories. So do you want to maybe jot that down? Do any of the above categories strike as having ethical significance and why? So do you need a recap just to quickly look at any of the categories or you're okay? Sounds like an interesting conversation with continuing this. Yeah. <laughs> um, have we lost someone in this process? Um, Jane. Jane. Jane's is here. Mm. Never mind. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, who wants to start? Uh, just tell us what your group discussed. If you would say who's in your group. I was in a group with Skip and Janet. And none of us could see any ethical concerns at play in the categories we were discussing. Right. Do you want to expand on that? Well, um, like about boiling a kid in its mother's milk. Um... I mean, it would be one thing if you were boiling it alive in its mother's milk, but um, I, I guess uh, it would be unethical to kill the young of an animal. Uh, oh, but, but we can kill. We can. The Torah says we can do that. Yeah. Do. Okay, yeah. so. So, um, so yeah, so so that does away with that ethic, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, great. What about another group? <laughs> uh, well, with, I was with, group. yeah, I was with Casey and Jamie, and uh, mm -hmm. he, uh, um, uh, we he was talking about about uh, that we mentioned about uh eating predator animals and how one uh the, the constructionist rabbi was talking about consuming blood uh, through the blood and all that. Uh, I think that's a, a nice midrash if you want to follow uh Kashru. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were talking about how uh it's there was an argument. Uh, at some point, that slaughtering to uh, uh, extended uh, to cutting the yugal, or I, I forgot how you call it. It's okay, less, yeah. yeah, it's less it's less painful than other ways of of uh, slaughtering animals. Well, maybe less 
I don't know. I that's that was the argument. Um, but I was reminded how uh, Sikhs uh, do not eat uh, kasher or halal meat because uh, they consider that not stunning an animal is actually less humane. Uh, there, uh, you, you can't have kasher uh, meat is not uh, does uh, uh, you can't stun an animal and exsanguinate it well. So. Kosher meat right. is not the, the animals destined for kosher meat are not stunned first. So, right. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, but, uh, so, I mean, how you speak about ethical, I think also has to do with your circumstances. And that's something that we also mentioned that you, if you're a, a shepherd thinking about, well, how to deal with your uh, animals you're going to eat is, is ethical, but if you uh, if you are a farmer, maybe it's a different thing. Or if you live uh, of the sea, it's a different thing. So it, it's kind of like some rules make more uh, can be argued in some sense uh, as ethical, depending on where you live. Yeah. Thank you. And another group. There, who was in another group? I'll just so uh, uh, it was Rebecca and Heather. Uh, Heather, and we mostly talked about that ethics change over time. <laughs> we thought, and um, I'm not sure what other we, no, we, we did say. I know I we said that you know yeah. I think the the boiling the kid in the mother's milk was live <laughs> to start with, but I'm not sure. And we said we thought that's an ethical maybe component, but we didn't see a lot of that. Anyone else want to fill in what I missed? Yes. Who were you in? You were with Rebecca and Casey. No, Rebecca. Uh, Heather. Heather. Okay. We kind of talked about other portions of what makes things kosher and what doesn't, and which rules we go by as opposed to perhaps other other groups and how yeah as paula and betty said how those will change um depending on the times we're in or uh depending on the community you're in as well right yeah have i missed anyone i think there was another group wasn't there david uh, what group were you in uh with phyllis and simon um, right. Yeah. We talked about the common thread through at least part of it. It's, it seems to be like minimizing harm. Um, mm -hmm. Though Phyllis pointed out that uh, people who do keep kosher don't necessarily think about the ethical implications of it. They just kind of do it because they've been commanded to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, Laurie, you were with me and James. Do you want to say what we talked about? Yes, we talked about like there were certain practices, not necessarily certain animals, but certain practices such as eating from a limb of a living animal or an animal that has an injury that were um, unethical, would have been unethical and that the rules seem to have ethical um, value um, because they would be less cruel and also slaughtering an animal quickly so that they immediately lost consciousness and didn't um, suffer, would have the ethical backing. Right, yeah. So, so it seems like a lot of people are talking about cruelty, minimizing suffering. Um, the the uh, kid in its mother's milk seems to be a big one for people. Although it never crossed my mind before that, uh, to think, well, you're not boiling it alive. However, uh, to me, that seems like a particular. That for me is actually I don't I don't mix milk and meat in the same uh, meal, um, and for me that's uh, a, a type of let's call it mindfulness. It's when I when I have to make the choice between food that has milk and meat and food that doesn't, I have to choose the one that doesn't because it reminds me of cruelty, uh, the topic of cruelty to animals. 
So that's a way um, of not necessarily being strictly kosher, but um, adhering to the to the meaning of it. The meaning of it. Right for me, the the meaning, the meaning that I derive from it, which a lot of people derive. So shall we have a look at what some uh, what some people have said about what this what these rules mean? Um, which there are a lot of explanations. Uh, where are we? Um, here we are. Um, can I have volunteers? Uh, yeah. So Kashrut laws are presented as kukim, that is commandments that are given without explanation. And there have always been attempts to explain them. Uh, can somebody read that for me? Maimonides writes, all the foods with which Torah prohibits us to eat have some bad and damaging effects on the body. Thank okay. you. Somebody read the next one. Nachmanides, 1200s fish without fins and scales usually live in the lower muddy stata. They breed in musty swamps and eating them can be injurious to health. And somebody read the next one. Tama discusses kosh root as having to do with refinement of the self. Good affects not only the body, but also the soul. A person becomes what they eat. By refraining from eating carnivorous animals, we develop nonviolent traits. You and somebody read the next one. The fact of Jewish continuity. Kashrut was a clear definer of Jewish culture for millennia. Kashrut builds a fence around the Jewish people and thus sets it apart, the true meaning of holy. Right. What do you, what do you think? Uh, hi, this is Janet. I was, I was just saying that uh, in our group, uh, you know, I had brought up that the whole idea of kosher is as inherently unethical because of the last reason, because it's a way to try and exclude other people and to only keep with yourself and to say us on the inside are good and you on the outside are bad and I'm not even going to eat with you. So if there's an ethics to it, it's inherently unethical. This is, I've, I've never, I mean, I've known about kosher my whole life and I've, I've always thought this idea is so, ex so exclusionary and discriminatory. It's just offensive. To my whole identity. <laughs> Amazed right, I didn't um, what you said. But to sorry. that comment, plenty of congregations. I, I sorry, I didn't I didn't hear the last I didn't hear the last comment, sorry. Oh I, just, it, oh, I was just saying that's my my that's how I felt my whole life. But I understand that other people there's other, you know, they might totally disagree with me. I totally get that. Oh yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry, Philip. But to that, that comment, um, other denominations and faiths have something similar or do something, you know, otherwise to do the same thing, to isolate themselves or identify themselves as a community or unify themselves as a community to, um, you know, that binds them. Um, th there are food um, rituals in almost every faith. And every faith has something around food that they identify themselves as different and, you know, isolate themselves over. They, it just might yeah. not be as obvious as kashrut, but, um, yeah. you know, all, yeah. all communities have something that they do around food rituals. Yeah, I know. Right. I think that, that that's identifying in a positive way is totally different than exclusion. And kashrut has a tendency to be very focused on exclusion, to me, which is why it's discriminatory. I mean, if, if someone, you know, Italian has like something good, it, to me, it's a celebration. It's a positive thing. It's not it's trying to exclude other people. Well, yeah. on that point, Janet, on that point, Janet, my family are Italian. Um, and it, I can tell you categorically, Italians think that non-Italians are disgusting with their food habits. Right. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes. Right. And, and non Italians mix fish and uh, cheese. Non Italians mix food together, 
and yeah. mixing food together in Italian in Italian culture is disgusting. Yes. So yeah. you know, um, yeah, you but, know, I'm, but I'm Italian, laughing about this. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but it's, but, but it's, there are certain people uh, that will not even drink wine if there's a non-Jewish person present in the table, because that non-Jewish per pe present person could be internally consecrating the wine to the gods and that even has to do with yeah well that the re reason for why why wine is kasher or not kasher uh it has to do with if it can be consecrated or not to the to the uh, 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 to other uh, deities and uh and the in certain sects of Hasidut the Hasidim that will not eat in the house of an Orthodox Jews, Jew. I mean, they will, they can invite an Orthodox Jew to eat with them, but they will not eat in the house of an Orthodox Jews, Jew because they are not sure they are kosher enough. So, right. yeah, yeah, I, I, I also find it's one thing to define identity about around uh, food habits, and and I, I think that's mm. valid, but but there is a I mean, there's a whole strain of uh, to be different from the other uh, or not to partake, not to even eat with someone else. Yeah. Uh, that that right. makes you, that really uh, means if even if you have strangers in your, yeah. land, in your land, do not do not eat with them, which is and I, and I'm, strange. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with that. Other people have a right to practice their faith the way they practice their faith. And I'm okay with that. Um, oh, there yeah. are portions of the African American community that practice faiths where they will. I was raised in a household where I was not allowed to eat outside my household because of the faith that I practiced. I could not go to my friends' birthday parties. I could. I was not even invited because they knew I wouldn't eat in their homes. Um, they could come to my house and eat, but I couldn't go to theirs because of the faith we practiced. Um, and, right. and that's just the way I was raised. And I didn't think anything of it. And I never thought I was better than. I just thought I was different. <laughs> and I knew I had a faith yeah. that taught me. I ate a certain way. I did certain things before I ate. I prayed a certain way, you know, and other families didn't. And so therefore I was not allowed to eat. It, didn't, it wasn't that I was being raised to think that I was better than, but I was being taught that I was different than. And therefore, right, yeah. I could not do things in other homes that I could do at home. So therefore, right. I had to eat at home. That's the yeah. way it was. You know? And, Rebecca, and, Rebecca. Oh, I sorry, Phyllis. Sorry. I'm sorry, Phyllis. Go on. You know, I can respect that. I think sometimes when I'm the more liberal one, I have to be careful to also not judge the stricter one. You know, right. for what they believe and what they hold true to. They have a right to hold true to whatever they hold true to. I don't have to like it. I don't have to do it, you know, but they have a right to live that life. It doesn't make them more judgmental. It just makes them different than what I do. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Rebecca's got a hand up. Oh, yes, I do. Thank you very much. Let me lower that down. Um, so I had uh, said this when we were in the group, but um, the a lot of the kosher laws, I guess I feel are rules that you know, were quite important a couple thousand years ago when we didn't have modern inventions. Um, and it's just uh, better to say we cannot do this thing because, you know, they might not have understood the exact science behind it. But, you know, eating this animal might make you sick or mixing this stuff together might make you sick or whatever they noticed. Um, some dangerous things happen when you mix seeds, maybe. Um so we understand now that um, why these things happen, um, we can still like honor the rules because they're there for a reason and we can keep kosher to remember, you know, what our ancestors or what, um, you know, Jewish people did back then. So that's kind of how I feel about kosher. It's kind of honoring what past <laughs> people have gone through um whether or not we need it now you know that's up to the individual in the group i think but uh 
right. that that's kind of what I think. I mean, it, you know, it was necessary so many years ago, but now maybe it's not so necessary, but we're doing it because we want to honor um, the right. culture. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Um, so I, during the lockdown in 2020, I was living with a friend uh, who was not Jewish. And uh, one day he brought pork home and cooked it in the oven. And I was, I found it abominable. <laughs> I found it disgusting. Um, and he couldn't get his head around it. And so we had lots of conversations about what that means. How do you come from this culture that, you know, you have such a visceral reaction to something as normal as uh, pig meat in, in the oven? And I was scrubbing the oven and I was I wasn't telling him not to do it, but I felt disgusted. And it was quite obvious that I felt disgusted. Um, and, he, and he said, I don't understand people that have such rules around what they eat, you know. And I said, well, you think you don't, but if I made, I live in England and I don't know if you have it in the United States, but we have like Sunday roast, like a Sunday roast, um, you know, it's like roast meat, vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very typical English thing. And I said, if I made a Sunday roast and put it on a big tray in the middle of the, on the middle of the floor and just didn't give you any cutlery, you'd soon find out whether your culture has rules about how you eat and what you eat, you know? Like, yeah. whereas, if, whereas if I did that in the Middle East, uh, if I made, like, rice and chicken and it's a Middle Eastern dish and put it on a tray in the middle of the floor, that would be normal. Or you if know? you serve the worms, like, and you think, would you like to have some worms to eat? You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. yeah. So on this note, um, I want us to remember uh, what we said about the difference between impure and abominable. Um, somebody's just written uh, a comment, but I can't read the chat. Does somebody want to re read it? Uh, to Gabrielle says, to clarify my sense, yes and yes. Agree with Phyllis about right to have their rules and live according to them. Agree with Janet about not feeling identified with them and not finding some of them meaningful. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so yeah. Uh, back to abominable. Do, do you remember what what I said? Abominable means. It shall be an abomination to you. What does that mean? Shekhar. Disgusting. Disgusting. Yeah. Um, and this idea of there being. We don't eat those certain foods, so therefore the people that do are disgusting and abominable. Um, this is what the Torah says. This is what the, the Torah commands us to um, to believe and to think. It will be disgusting to you. you. You will not do that, that those other people do. Those people are disgusting. So um, bearing that in mind, who would eat any of these foods? I have a neighbor that would. Do you know what they are? That one well, of them is that pigs. down there on the bottom. Guinea pig. Yeah, dog. She yeah. Guinea pig. You bragged about it. And dog. And what is it? Crickets or something? Crickets. And that looks like what? A cat or a rabbit or something? A cat? It's got a Top long. Top left tail. is a rat. Top left is a rat. Uh, I have a neighbor would right. eat all of that. Right, but does anyone in the room think that's lovely? Well, I think if I was starving to death and that they, they were already dead. That's a different question. And that's I didn't have question. to kill them. <laughs> but no, I don't think I could, especially dogs or cats. No way. They're people. Dogs and cats are people to me. Right. I probably so, could eat the crickets. I'll be okay. honest. I've been, in the coaster, army. But... <laughs> I've been in the <laughs> army. I probably could eat the crickets. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody in the room not think that eating dog is disgusting? Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't willingly eat dog, but I've been in countries where it has been eaten. And so, you know, I, I, I can't right. say if I got hungry enough that I wouldn't. I wouldn't right. willingly eat a dog. No. OK, no. So is there anyone in the room that does not think it's disgusting to eat dogs? I don't think it's disgusting because I know there are people no. that do. Right. But I know there any... are 
cultures that do it. So I don't right, think yes. it's disgusting. Right, it is. Yeah, thank you. So who thinks it's disgusting? Yes. And seeing hands. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, what about rats? Who thinks eating rats is disgusting? Yeah. What about guinea pigs? Uh, yeah. I don't know. If I go to Peru, if I go to Peru, I might eat the guinea pig. You might. Yeah, guinea you pigs are complicated right? because in places like Peru, they're an important protein source. I mean, in their culture, I mean, for me, it's disgusting because it's not what I grew up with. But I culturally right. and biologically, I understand why people eat guinea pigs and there's mm -hmm. value in it. But it's not for me. Right. No. So crickets also. I mean, I think it's disgusting. I think eating dog is disgusting. I think eating rats are disgusting. And I think eating guinea pigs are disgusting. <laughs> You know, so those of you that believe it's disgusting, it's abominable to you. So can you imagine going to the home of somebody and they serve up a nice dog? Mm. What would your reaction be? I would tell them I wasn't hungry, that I was not feeling good and, you know, I was going to have to skip dinner. Right. I would just say no, thank you. But this is yeah. interesting because it it presents um, the question of where do you draw the line on what is acceptable to you and what isn't. So right. Martin, you were talking about like uh, your family's Italian. I lived in Italy for quite a while. I lived in Japan. And so I know in Italy, um, I had friend like not my Italian friends, American friends who were quite taken aback that you could eat horse, that they have horse meat for sale in Italy. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that's considered yeah, France, from an American true. perspective that could be is considered disgusting or it's unethical, um, but it was acceptable, you know, in Italy. So that's, you know, uh, we depend on our culture <laughs> and how we're raised for a lot of the mm -hmm. where we draw this what, line. What, what comes to right mind is the fact to me is the fact that there are cultures where people eat are cannibals, but they're rare. Yes. And yet there are some cultures where people actually eat people, but that would be the ultimate in abomination to me and to most people probably. Because you can get, yeah. like, you can get prion disease. <laughs> but yeah. Right. I think a lot of the, the dietary stuff is ethnocentric and cultural. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, um, it, it's, 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 you, you I don't want to go out on a limb and say tribal, but I'm leaning in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem. I have no problem with it being considered tribal. Uh, we are tribal, you know, we're humans and we organize ourselves according to tribes. So, yeah, um, but some people are stricter these... about it than others, Martin. I mean, I'm much more flexible yeah. when I'm, you know, if I go to Peru and somebody invites me to their home, um, even if I wouldn't cook it myself or, or slaughter it myself, I, I might be more lenient about eating it than you would be. And I found that even with, with Jewish people I know in Toronto, um, I mean, the, one of the most famous pork rib restaurants was actually owned and, and the chef was actually Jewish. <laughs> right. So, yeah, of course, people are flexible. But as cultures, we all have rules about what we eat. Um, and we all have foods that we think are disgusting. Um, so the idea that just because the Torah lists a group of foods and says that the people that eat them are disgusting, that that's somehow more ethnocentric than the cultures that we come from. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not true. We all, every single person in this room comes from a culture, whether it was Jewish or not, that considers other cultures disgusting, or other cultures, food practices, practices disgusting. Um, so... I just wanted to show these images to kind of get that kind of feeling that, you know, I should have, I, I saw pictures of dog meat. There were dogs roasted on tables mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't even look at them and I didn't want to expose people to them. So imagine being an ultra Orthodox, a Hasidic Jew, and you go to someone's house and you, you're invited to go to someone's house and you know that in that culture they eat pigs. No difference. The feeling for them is no different, mm -hmm. right? Right. Oh. Yeah. So some right. people are very strongly ethnocentric and other people are not. I've noticed a very big spectrum on that. 
Right, Jamie, but all, all cultures are ethnocentric. That's the point. Yeah. If you wanted to get me, you would have to do what my dad did. He brought home a raccoon. Yeah, I wasn't eating that. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I drew the line. <laughs> yeah. I've come to the right. conclusion that I don't want to eat pigs, not because of kosher, but because they're so intelligent. Yes, I was about to uh, yeah. share the same point. Yes, um, because, yeah, they are intelligent. And also the way that they're mass slaughtered, I think, can be an ethical concern as well. Yeah, I mean, you can widen that to how any animal is mass slaughtered, like, you know, but yeah, uh, sure. particularly for pigs, I think, you know. Sure. I'm a yeah. vegetarian, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's quite easy for yeah. me, but yeah, that is a concern. Sure. Chills are mass sure, sure. Right, so let's have a look at the reconstructionist approach. Um, can somebody who hasn't spoken much maybe read this? I haven't read that much so far. As a communal and personal discipline, kashrut became an opportunity to invest the daily activity of eating with a dimension of holiness, whether accomplished through words of blessing, the style of preparation of the food, the types of cookery used, or the inside or the kinds of food served, kashrut became an important daily affirmation of identity and values. Far from being the pot and pantheism with which it is often regarded by critics, kashrut emerged in my life as a vehicle for spiritual and bodily renewal. The separation of meat and dairy foods, the disturbing proximity between symbols of life and death carried a similarity, similarly powerful association, though I did not choose to observe all the stringencies associated with the absolute separation of these products. The avoidance of serving food that was obviously meat with food that was obviously dairy became an opportunity for honoring the boundaries of life and death. In sorting out expect respectful but voluntary commitment to kashrut, reconstructionism has an uh, was an and reconstruction was and allows for and encourages people to find a place in the spectrum of observance. It was possible to begin to sort out where kashrut worked and where it did not. Mordecai Kaplan's teaching that the ritual commandments are folkways designed to affect identification with the Jewish people led to an understanding that kashrut can be observed in some areas, but not others, without inconsistency. And as long as the level of observance supports and strengthens identification with the Jewish people is a functionally appropriate level of observance. Rabbi Richard Hirsch, 2000. Thank you. That was a long, a long reading. Um, but yeah, um, any thoughts on that? I, I like, I was um, taken with the idea that dairy is taken from a live animal. You're not killing something. You're taking it, but you're not killing anything. And except maybe an egg, I suppose. But um, but you're, otherwise you're killing something. And I, I like that distinction. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, me too. Any other thoughts? I think I like the fact that it allows for some degree of diversity. Not everybody is going to apply cash root in the same way. And yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think it, I appreciate that it's values or it recognizes that people change and therefore our rituals and customs will need to change to progress with us. Right. Yeah. I think this also emphasizes something that was said in one of those podcasts you mentioned is that it's not enough for to abstain of eating certain foods to be kosher. It's also kind of like the intentionality. So it's right. keeping kosher. It's a way of mindfulness about what you eat and what you not eat. So while I am not into trying to give up. Uh, I mean, I, I don't identify with everything that uh, Rabbi Hirsch is ex expressing here. I do uh, find that uh, being mindful about the food you eat, uh, for me, has value. And also, I think when I'm, I'm mostly uh, related, I, I relate most to the foods that are meant to commemorate something like 
some of the uh, what is kashet lepesach and whatnot, yeah. uh, or or something like that. Because well, there I am engaging with, uh, you know, in a way with a with a story that has meaning, um, a legend that has meaning for the identity of Jewish people. So right. I'm perfectly happy to abstain from the eleven food for a week, or at least to eat a, as much matzah as possible. Is that going right. stick? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, for example, in at Pesach in Italy, there's a, a famous dish called matzanya, um, which is lasagna made from matzah uh -huh. and, and has vegan cheese. And that's oh. amazing. I, like, I think, you know, that's, I like, I like, you know, like creativity. the challenge and yeah. yeah, the creativity involved in everything and making the biscotti mm. in a certain way, like within a certain time frame before the onset of Pesach, you know, those kinds of things. So I, I quite um, identify with this, uh, you know, what is kosher for a specific time? Yeah, I like that idea. Um, what about, uh, does anybody have any other thoughts about the... Um, the, the different levels of observance supports and strengthens uh, identity. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Or perhaps you've already said it. Are there any thoughts around that? Well, I was just thinking about the previous person who talked about intention, and I think the intention matters a great deal because most of my life, the intention around kosher always had a twist of narcissism and arrogance attached to it. It always was, you know, we're not those uh, implied stupid people who, eat, you know, eat white bread and mayonnaise. And, they, you know, it was always a put down. There was always a twist of a put down on almost every kosher conversation that I have ever had. You know, in numerous settings. And, and if it was in a show, for sure, it always had this arrogant narcissistic twist to it and so i think that intentionality uh matters drastically uh because it's so because i just have grown up with such an arrogant attitude that i which actually had the opposite effect on me i was repelled by it and so this is very beautifully written with to try and have something that's very different very mindful attitude about it, as opposed to a, a thus narcissistic attitude to it. So I thought that was really nice. Right, thank you, yeah. Okay, so let's look at what uh, humanistic Judaism... Humanistic Judaism doesn't particularly say anything as a whole about Kashrut, but Sherwin Wine wrote about Kashrut. Um, can somebody read this? Sure. Okay. Humanistic Jews recognize that some dietary rules are necessary for health, and health is a humanistic value. Humanistic dietary laws are based on information made available by modern science and can be adjusted at any time to fit new evidence. If the word kosher means fit for use, what is kosher for some Jews maybe trafe for others, and vice versa. Sherwin Wine, 1990. Right, thank you. So I thought that this one and the Reconstructionist one tie in nicely together. I, th I think, personally, we can reconstruct um, Kashrut, uh with with our kind of modern you know, according to modern science and what, what Sherwin Wine said, I think the two go together very well. For me personally, there are some kosher laws that I take as, you know, this is the way I do it. It's a way to identify as Jewish. It's a way to think of, think about intentionality. Um, it's not uh, to be arrogant to say, oh, well, I don't eat this, but you, but you do, so you're disgusting, you know. But I recognize that I'm a human being who is ethnocentric, like everybody. And, you know, that I think that when my friend cooked uh, a pig in my, in my oven, it was disgusting, <laughs> just like uh, we would feel if we went to someone's house who was cooking a dog in their oven. You know, so I recognize that. 
and I but I think that this is a very nice way to kind of reconstruct the idea of kashrut in itself. Um, so I wonder does anybody have any uh, any views on this um, that we haven't already expressed? Well, I was thank thinking you, about Sherwin Wine. Oh, I'm sorry. I just said thank you, Sherwin Wine. I, I like I like that what he said. <laughs> I was thinking about a couple of years ago. I got to go to a meeting of the SHJ board that was in Chicago, and while there, it happened to fall during Passover. And what was interesting was some of the meals we had at lunch. I remember we had a spread of food. But there was this acknowledgement that there are different levels of observance. And so, for instance, there was, if I remember right, there was there was roast beef and there was cheese, different parts of the table. There was matzah and there was regular bread. And um, at, at that time, I was pretty strict on only eating matzah during my Passover. So it was great. There was matzah. Other people didn't have the same rule and they had their bread and it, it kind of worked. I could see that for some people that might be really hard or it might not be workable to have the foods in close proximity to each other. But I kind of liked it myself because it was a nod to recognizing there were different levels of observance and we could still have a meal together. Right. Uh, I remember when... Go uh, ahead. Sorry, one... Uh, okay. I, I remember when my friend cooked pork. Um, it, it made me think about whether it was okay for me to feel the way I did, but also not to make him change, you know? So I thought, yeah, it's perfectly acceptable for me to find this weird and for, for me to not like it, but it's not acceptable for me to tell him not to do that. He's living with me. It, it may be my flat, but he's living with me and I have to treat him as an equal and I'm not going to tell him uh, what to eat and what not, uh, or not what to cook and what not to cook in my house. But that's I'm in my four, early forties, but in my early twenties it would have been quite different. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to point out. I really like the idea of holding on to what is trace for me may not be trace for someone else. And stay and trying to really stay in a space of allowing someone else the same freedom I want them to allow for me, you know, and that's hard. That's really, really hard, you know, because a lot of times I see myself as being I want to always see myself as being the more liberal one, you know, and then I want to jump all up and be judgmental about what this other person is doing. Oh, it's just so wrong. It's just so wrong. Why can't they see it? They're just so wrong. And yeah. then I have to correct myself and say, wait a minute, right now I'm being the less accepting one. I have to allow that person to be wherever they are and do whatever they're doing and value whatever they're valuing the way they value it as much as I want to value what I'm valuing, you know, exactly. and, and give them the same freedom and be just as joyful for them to have what they have and value as I have what I have value. And so that's right, yeah. the very hardest part of being humanistic, I think sometimes is being human. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, um, I, I, think, go ahead. I think diet is all, I think diet is always a very sensitive topic. Um, it's, it, you know, people are very, um, people have strong views around food. <laughs> And um, I think um, we look even at the history of the reform movement in the United States. I think it was because they served served a shrimp at the diet at the graduation ceremony uh, in the um, I think it was the at that time, the Hebrew Union College. And yeah. then some of the some of the people there were disgusted by that. And that and then they said how they how they broke off to become part of what we came to know as the conservative movement. So. Uh, arguments around things like kosher food um, have 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 had their effect on Jewish history. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. Okay. Anybody else? Or uh, should I move on? Okay. So I thought that uh, between now and the next uh, class. You could uh, choose one way that you can apply the concept of kashrut to your diet and then practice it. So you could just 
choose any of the things that we've discussed and put some kind of, uh, apply it somehow to uh, your dietary habits. And then maybe next time uh, when we meet or if, even on our Facebook group or you could email or whatever, but somehow we could discuss together what what that meant to us, what that means. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Yep. So, go on. I will say yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, uh, so that's the end of the class. Uh, I'm um, happy to stay on um, for a while uh, and talk, but I think that we can stop uh, recording now. Thank you, everybody, for your participation and uh, respecting everyone's uh, comments and ideas. It was a really good class. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.